Real briefly, a little bit of background of this passage here. This is the, the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and to the churches in the region of Ephesus. And if we think about that church and what was going on in that region, he was writing to a group of believers that were in an urban context. They were a group of believers that were in a pagan context. Ephesus was, throughout the known world at that time, was known for the temples that were there. And so it was a place where people were practicing a lot of unhealthy and sinful things that were not in line with God's word and God's truth. This is the type of church that Paul is writing to here. So obviously, he's writing to us. Those are things that we can identify with, being in a context like that. And he begins, very interestingly enough, in this letter with worship. So we're going to look at this passage in verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." So this letter begins with this expression of praise. It follows the form of a Hebrew barakah or blessing. And it's different than the way that Paul normally begins his letters. He normally begins with kind of a greeting, a thanksgiving, and a prayer. And one of the things I like about this opening is it's kind of an outburst of praise. It seems like Paul began to give thanksgiving and praise to God, and then he just couldn't stop, so he just kept going. There's, it's, it's made up of one really long sentence of 202 words. It's just an outburst of praise. And it begins with the word blessed to denote the, the exaltation of God, and then proceeds to focus on all that God has done through Christ and the blessings that we as believers have received in Christ and God's plan for the future in Christ. And some theologians believe that this may have functioned as an early Trinitarian hymn, that the early church would have used it in that way. But this expression of praise also sets the tone for the entire rest of the letter. And in this letter, Paul is speaking to the church, about the church, about what it's like to have a healthy church, and all these things that are so important to us. And he sets the tone for the entire letter with this opening of verbal praise and worship. And I think there's a lot for us to learn here. There's kind of a template for us to think about worship and about verbal praise and worship and about how important it is and how essential it is in our lives. It's an essential part of our gathering when we get together like this. But it should also be a part of just the rhythm of our daily lives. We should be praising and worshiping God verbally. It's an essential part of our lives as believers. And I'm using the term verbal praise and worship intentionally to, to kind of make a distinction there because we know Romans 12.1 talks about the fact that our whole life is supposed to be worshiped to God. And that is certainly true, and that's how we should be living. We should be worshiping God in our work, in our relationships, in every part of our life. But this morning, we're specifically talking about verbal praise and worship, when we speak or sing praise to God. And 
it's clear in this passage that that's supposed to be a part of who we are as believers. It's supposed to define us in a lot of ways. I'll also be using the term genuine worship just to remind us that our verbal praise and worship can be hollow and insincere. Just because we're verbally praising God doesn't mean it's genuine, doesn't mean it's coming from our heart. And we know that that's actually one of the things that Jesus often chastised the Pharisees about because they were observing God's law and doing things externally that God had asked them to do, but it wasn't genuine, it wasn't coming from their heart. And so in, in the church, we desire to genuinely worship God from a place of spirit and truth that the scripture talks about. And Paul gives us a really beautiful template here for how to think about what that looks like in our lives, what it looks like in our gatherings. The first thing we see here is that we worship and praise God. Now that seems like a very very obvious point, right? But it's actually important for us to think about. Who are we worshiping? And Paul makes it clear in this passage that we are worshiping the almighty creator God of the Bible. He starts talking about that right away. He, this, this expression of praise is Trinitarian. So look at verses three. He talks about God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse five, he's talking about what God has done through Jesus. In verse 13, he's talking about the Holy Spirit that has sealed us. So he's making it cl- very clear who he's talking about and what God he's talking about. The, the Trinitarian God of the Bible, this worship is gospel focused. Verses five to 12 are all about what God has done through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus, that Jesus came and by his grace, he saved us. We've been redeemed, that he has given us forgiveness in verse 7, and in, in verse 8, he has lavished on us that forgiveness in all wisdom and insight. He's uniting all things in Christ. It's really focused on the gospel. That's a, a great template for us to think about in our worship. And one of the things we see here in this, this expression of praise that Paul gives us is that genuine worship is not ambiguous about who God is. And that's actually important in our culture. We say, okay, we praise and worship God, that's obvious, that we don't even have to talk about that. But in our culture, sometimes we do, because people worship a lot of things that are not the God that Paul is talking about here. And not just the obvious things like materialism or money or power or success. Yes, people worship those things and orient those li- their lives towards those things and follow after those things. But even at times in the church, we can begin to make God in our own image, to try to come to God and worship on our terms. And that's, we can't do that. God is a God of grace and mercy and love, but he is God. So when we approach him in worship, we approach him on his terms. And we worship God for who he is, not for who we want him to be. And we worship God for who he has revealed himself to be. And we find that in his word. So if, we're, if we are worshiping a God or a belief in our mind that is not God as he has revealed himself to be, that is just God as we want him to be or God as we feel like is comfortable or palatable for us culturally, or we say, well, this, this makes sense to the people around me, so this is how I think God is, then we're not really worshiping God in the way that he calls us to worship him. No God's made in our own, own image. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? And that's the, one of the first cornerstones of genuine worship. If we're going to worship and praise God, we need to make sure that we are worshiping him for who he is as he's revealed himself to be. The next thing we see here is that we worship and praise God because he is worthy. And there's two aspects of God's worthiness that are really clear in this passage. The first is God's majestic greatness. Paul points us towards that. He talks about God's eternal nature in verse four, how God chose us before the foundation of the world. 
He talks about God's love for us in verse 4, that what he did was in love. He talks about God's omnipotent will in verse 5, that God is all-powerful, that his, his purposes in the world cannot be thwarted and will not be thwarted. He talks about God's wisdom in verse 8. He talks about God's redemptive plan to heal all brokenness in verse 10. That's a beautiful expression of God's greatness. He talks about God's goodness in verse 3, in verse 6, in verse 8, in verse 11, verse 13, verse 14. Throughout the passage, he's talking about God's goodness. And when we genuinely encounter God's greatness, then worship becomes spontaneous. We don't have to convince ourselves to worship God when we have an encounter with God's power. It's, it's kind of like if you think about seeing something that's just kind of really awe-inspiring or amazing if you stand next to the Grand Canyon or you go to Niagara Falls or something. And it's not hard to just feel excited about it. It's not hard to turn to the person next to you and say, wow, I can't believe this. That, you know, it, it's not hard to have something to say about it. It's spontaneous. And that's true when we are beholding God and really encountering God's greatness. It, it, it's going to come out. It's spontaneous. We're going to begin to worship. These attributes that Paul describes in this passage of who God is, those things never change, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what's going on in our world. Those things never change. And that means that God is always worthy of our worship every day of our life, no matter what's happening. Even when we're going through really difficult times, God is worthy of our worship. Even when the world is falling apart and things are crazy and we're frightened, God is worthy of our worship. Even when we feel pain, God is worthy of our worship. And we know that, that we have that testimony in Scripture of the saints that worship God through lament as well as through joyful praise. So verbal praise and worship doesn't just have to be a joyful expression, it can also be an expression of lament. But we can always worship God, regardless of what we are facing in life, and we're called to do that. And if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna encounter God's greatness, even when we're going through difficult things, we have to take our eyes off of our circumstances and begin to look at God, begin to orient ourselves towards God. And one of the things that's true in my life, and I think it's true for a lot of us as believers, is that if we're struggling to worship, if we find ourselves in a place where we're saying, I just don't feel it, I don't feel in church, I don't feel it anywhere else, it's just not there. Yeah, I can say the words, but it's not meaningful to me. If we're struggling to worship, it's often because we're not seeing God's greatness. We don't see how great God is. We don't see how powerful he is. We're not looking at that vista that's in front of us. Because, like I said, if, we, if we're seeing that, then it's easy for us to begin to worship. The other aspect of God's worthiness that we see here is God's amazing grace. Throughout this passage, it's talking about God's love, God's lavish forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his wise and holistic and good plan for our good, for our physical, our spiritual, emotional good, and not just for us personally, but for the redemption of <clears throat> all things. How God is going to unite all things in Christ. God's plan to glorify himself through his people, through us. God's going to use us as a part of his plan. God's destiny for our future. And if we're in Christ and we have a relationship with him, that means that we are experiencing God's grace. We can't say, well, <clears throat> I know God's a God of grace, but I just, I, there's no grace in my life. If you are in Christ, if you have a relationship with him, you already have experienced his grace and you are experienced it moment by moment, day by day. And so that's something that God is worthy. We can praise him because of that. When we encounter the depth of God's grace, we start to see how much we need God. And we, we see how we become aware of how much he's done in our lives. And that's a part of seeing God 
and his worthiness and who he is is saying, okay, this is the reality of me, this is the reality of who I am, both my sin, all my mess, all my junk, but also just the ways I fall short, the ways I'm not who I want to be, the ways that I am <clears throat> not going to get where I want to go. I need God so much. And when we see that, we begin to say, wow, God has given me so much grace. God has forgiven me. God has changed me. God is at work in my life. God is filling in all these gaps. We can look around the world and <clears throat> see others who are struggling, and instead of having a heart that says, well, you know, I'm just better than that person, so that's, I, I can feel good about myself. I can feel proud about that. We can look at someone else and say, you know what, I would probably be in the exact same place if it wasn't for God's grace and God's work in my life. And that can cause us to worship. Honestly, we don't know what we don't know about our destiny apart from God's grace. It's true of all of us. We really don't know where we would be without God's grace. If God hadn't saved us, forgiven us, brought us into his family, began to transform us and change our desires to honor Christ, if God wasn't doing that, we really have no idea where we'd be. And so again, I'll say that if, if we're struggling to worship, a lot of times it's because we're not seeing the depth of our need for God and the depth of his grace for us. If we really are seeing how much God has forgiven us and how much we need him and how much he is at work in our life day by day and all of the wonderful things he is doing for us, then we're going to begin to worship. So what we see in both of those areas, looking at God's greatness and looking at God's grace in our lives, is we see that <clears throat> if we will look at God and who he is and behold him, then we'll begin to genuinely worship. Next thing we see in this passage is that we worship and praise because it is good for us. It's so healthy and good for us to take our focus off of our circumstances and our mess and our struggles and our challenges and turn towards God and look at who he is and see his greatness and see his grace. It's so healthy for us. Psalm 147, the first three verses say this, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. What do we see in that passage? We see people who are brokenhearted, who have wounds, who are outcasts, people who things are difficult in their lives, and, and it says it is good for them to sing praises to our God. It's pleasant, the song of praise is fitting. Ephesians chapter five, later on in this letter that Paul has written, he tells the, the believers to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so healthy and good for us to praise God and to do that in song, like we just did, but also just to do it in speaking with one another, encouraging one another, talking about God's goodness in our lives, talking about how we see God at work in someone else's life, how we're grateful for what God is doing in their life, how, how we're grateful for the way God is using them, or how we are seeing God taking them through something or, or, or supporting them in some way. Those are all ways that we can express worship to God and it encourages one another, and it encourages us. When we're in some of our most difficult moments, and life is terrible, and we feel like everything is going wrong, and we've lost our job, or we have experienced a, a relationship where someone has said terrible things about us, or, or maybe we've experienced a loss, someone that we love has passed away, whatever we're going through, even in those moments, if we're in Christ, then we are loved, we're redeemed, we're forgiven, we're accepted, and we have a future hope. We have a blessed inheritance like this passage talks about, and we have an eternal destiny of victory and of fellowship with God in heaven. That's the truth about everyone in this room. If you're in Christ, that's the truth about you. And so even if you're going through something really difficult, that doesn't, 
I'm, I'm not talking about saying, oh, well, I can just ignore my problems and wish them away. No. Life is challenging. It's hard, and that's real. And there are times when we feel that brokenness so heavily and we're discouraged. I'm not saying that, that we don't. As believers, we feel that. That's why, like I said earlier, there are all the scriptures of lament because life comes in on us just like anybody else. But even in those moments, we know that we are loved and forgiven, we're redeemed, we're accepted, that God is at work in our life for, for his glory, for our good, that we have a future hope, that we have this destiny of victory and fellowship with God in heaven. And we can worship and it's good for us to think about that. In, in the darkest moments of our life, when we're really struggling, it's good for us to say, yes, this is hard and it hurts and I'm, I'm being crushed by it, but God loves me and I'm forgiven and he's redeemed me and even all my mess, he's at work and he's making something good out of it. He's transforming me and I'm not gonna be in this place forever. <laughs> God's gonna change me into, into something new, and that's gonna happen in this life, but ultimately, God's gonna take me on to heaven in the future. And so even the pain that I'm feeling right now is a temporary pain. It's good for us to know that. It's good for us to say that. It's good for us to say that to one another. It's good for us to say that to ourselves. And we do that when we worship. The songs we were singing this morning, singing about how we have a savior who's mighty to save. That's what we're doing. We're saying, hey, life is tough, but Jesus is bigger and he's powerful and he's mighty and he can save us out of all of the challenges of our life. It's good for us to say that to each other. It's healthy, it encourages us, it keeps us going. Worship and praise is so good for us emotionally, it's so good for us physically, it's so good for us spiritually. And then the last thing we see here is that we worship and praise because it's a witness to others. <clears throat> Some of the earliest second century texts talking about the early church agree that the worship gatherings of the early church that happened on Sunday were first and foremost what they called Eucharistia or Thanksgiving. That was the, what defined those gatherings was that they were about Thanksgiving to God. Worship and praise to God and talking about who God is and how good he is and exalting him and talking about his work in our lives has always been a defining characteristic of the church, of Christians from the very, very beginning. In the second century, there was this pagan writer named Celsus who didn't like Christians. He was a critic of the church. He was writing to someone else and he commented in this letter that he didn't like Christian worship <laughs> because the chants and the songs that they sang were unfamiliar to his ears, but they were also so beautiful that he felt that they dulled his, his uh, reasoning faculties and made him more open to the Christian arguments. From the very beginning, we as a people, followers of Jesus, have been known as people who worship and sing and sing beautifully, and that doesn't mean that we all necessarily know how to play instruments or even sing on key, but it's beautiful because it comes from our hearts and it's genuine and it's worship to God. And that's been a part of who we are from the very beginning. And it's a part of who we are now. In Acts 2, verses 46 and 47, it says this, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous heart, praising God and having favor with the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That was the very first church. Every day they were getting together, doing different things, and one of the things they were doing was praising God. And one of the powerful things about worship is that genuine worship and praise to God, it can't be duplicated or counterfeited in the world. We see that in, in, in American culture. We have this beautiful tradition of gospel music in the US that comes from the African American church. Well, there's a difference between someone singing that song in church and someone just singing it on the stage at an award show who doesn't know Jesus. It's two totally different things. You can't counterfeit genuine worship. And the world around us notices that too. 
It's a witness. When we are genuinely worshiping God, they say that's something beautiful and that's an expression that I, you don't find anywhere else. It can't be duplicated. And genuine worship and praise to God is always focused on God, not on us. And that's another reason it's a witness. Genuine worship and praise to God is, is some form of saying, listen, this is who I was and then this is who God made me or is making me to be. This is my present situation, but this is what God has for me. This is what my future used to be, but now because of Jesus, this is what is in my future. Those types of statements define our worship where we're saying, look, it's about God. God did this. It's not about me. The focus is on him and how good he is and how great he is and all that he's done in my life. That's what we see in, in these verses 3 to 14 of Ephesians 1. And that type of worship is always a witness to other people. The people around us, they may think it's strange, they may think it's unusual, but they'll notice it and people will say, that's, that's different. What are you talking about? Why are you talking about it? Why are you joyful? Why are you talking about your God even when life is terrible and I can see that it's terrible and you're going through a time of lament but you're still worshiping in that? Those things are all a witness to the people around us. So I want to close out with application for us. Like I said, this passage gives us this beautiful expression of worship. It's a great template for us to think about. And it makes it clear that this should be a part of our lifestyle. And clearly in the church, just like we worship this morning, but it should be a part of our lifestyle every day. That we should verbally be praising God, talking to ourselves. Nothing wrong with, with talking to yourself if you're going to preach the gospel or talk about who God is to yourself. That's a healthy, good thing. We should be doing that, especially when we're going through difficult times. We should be telling ourselves, you know what? It's hard, but God's at work in my life. God loves me. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. That should be a part of our life rhythm. But I know it's not always easy. So how do we do that? How do we make that happen? I want, to, I want us to think about something for just a minute. To illustrate this, we can, we can take a mental excursion real, real fast. So let's pretend, you know, if you go down Halstead here to 31st, and then you just go east on 31st, as far east as you can go, you get to the lake, and there's the beach park there, right? Everybody been to 31st Street Beach? And it's a really pretty beach park. There's that point out there where the marina is. You can walk out there, and, and they have kind of these big boulders for breakwater. You can look back towards the city. If you haven't done it, you should do it sometimes. It's a really, really cool spot. It's a great spot to take pictures of the skyline. But if you go out there, and if I asked each one of you to describe what you would see when you're there, your answers would vary depending on how you were oriented. If you're looking straight east from out there, all you're going to see is water. <laughs> you're just going to see the lake, which is beautiful. But that's all you're going to see. If you're looking back to the west, then you're going to see the city skyline. You're going to see Lakeshore Drive. You're going to see something totally, totally different depending on how you're oriented. And I think that's really instructive for us in worship, especially when we're struggling to worship. We're saying, I, don't, I, I know I need more worship in my life. I want to express praise to God, but it, it's not coming naturally right now. I don't feel it. We need to think about what are we oriented towards. And sometimes in life, we need to turn the eyes of our soul away from our problems, away from our success, away from our failures, away from our relationships, away from our entertainment, away from all our social media feeds, and, and say, I'm going to orient myself towards God. I'm going to look at God. I'm going to behold God. And we do that as we look in his word. We do that as we look into our hearts and recount God's grace in our life. And we say, you know what? This is what God has done for me. And this is what God has done in the past. Or we look at the lives of other believers around us and say, I see God doing this in someone else's life. And, and it's a beautiful thing. I, I see something encouraging happening with a brother or sister. When we do those things, we begin to orient ourselves towards looking at God. And when we look at God, then we can begin to worship. The scripture talks about this. 
Psalm 75, 1 says, we give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Psalm 124, 1 says, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. And so I would challenge and encourage all of us to do that and to seek ways to do that in our lives. Begin to orient our soul towards looking at God. There's a lot of stuff for us to look at in the world. Way too much. We can't take it all in. And sometimes we need to turn away from those things and orient ourselves towards God. And if we'll do that, it'll be so good for us. It'll be life for us. It'll be life-giving. It'll be a witness to those around us. And ultimately, it's an identity that God has given you as one of his children is to worship him as a worshiper. It's who we are. We are worshipers. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your greatness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for who you are, all that you have done in redemption. We thank you for all that you have done in our lives, and we are undeserving. We need you desperately, God. And God, you love us and have redeemed us and forgiven us. I pray that you would help all of us to orient our souls to look at that, to look at you, to look at what you've done for us, to look at your grace. And may worship come out of us. In Jesus' name, amen.